Ladies and gentlemen, last but not least, for the concluding remarks, I'd like to welcome the Secretary General of the European People's Party and the Secretary Treasurer of the Martin Center, Antonio Lopez Isturiz White, joining us online. Tono, welcome. Thank you very much, Anna, and uh, dear friends. It is an honor for me to close this year's extraordinary and uh, for the first time, uh, Digital uh, Economic Ideas Forum. I would like to especially thank uh, Nicolas Jurinda, Tommy Kutanen, moderators like Anna, like Roland, uh, Dimitra, uh, Margareta, and uh, all those people behind the cameras, uh, the dedicated staff of the Martin Center. Thank you very much. Uh, mission accomplished. It was not easy, I know. But the purpose of this year's uh, forum is to discuss the potential and ability of the European Union to have uh, a more geopolitical and a coherent economic strategy on the global stage. Like uh, my friend, Nicolas Jurinda, we are set, we are facing urgent challenges. Not just the immediate danger of a pandemic that isn't slowing down, but also other threats that will continue being imminent even after the pandemic. Trade protectionism, great power, competition, rapid technology, innovations, outdated educational systems, and many others. In this context, exchange of view like the ones we had yesterday and today are key. Thanks to the Martin Center and its staff, we were able to hear expert voices on the most pressing issues facing Europe. And not just from politicians. We heard from all sectors of society, from civil servants, from uh, private sector and academics. As we saw, the pandemic has been an accelerator of uh, existing trends, trends that will continue existing in the future. The challenges have to be met with bold action at the European level. And in this forum, we had lively discussions about the detailed policy proposals currently underway in the European Commission and the European Parliament. This is exactly the case, <clears throat> for example, of the Green, green Deal and the ecological transition. Through the, great deal, the Green Deal, <clears throat> the EU has set enormous expectations, and it has done so the right way, involving the private sector with targeted and practical solutions. As the Commission has aptly named one of its instruments, we are striving for a just transition. A transition where the cost is distributed and it is fair. A transition that includes everyone and leaves no one behind. Though we represent less than 10% of global emissions, the world recognizes that we are a leader in this field. Our actions have reverberated across markets and countries. And as my friend Jirki Katainen said, Europe will show the way to build a sustainable and carbon neutral economy. We have to take advantage of the historic recovery packets and the subsequent funding. We need bold actions at the European and at member state level. And I am glad that as always, DPP has been the most productive voice in this debate. Another EPP priority that we discussed was world trade and the many challenges it is facing. From the pandemic to global trade tensions and the race of populism, world trade and the very idea of open economies are being questioned. Trade is a crucial element for our prosperity, and we need to protect that. But we cannot trade just for the sake of doing trading. As my friend and the new European Trade Commissioner, Vice President Dombrovskis, and said, and previous Commissioner Phil Hogan defended, we have to be open to world trade while dealing with the new world reality we are living in. An open strategic economy to take care of ourselves while it's not being naive. We are open. But we have to face challenges from other countries, which means we need a new strategy. Once again, this Commission has been able to think strategically about the challenge we face with the upcoming review of our trade policy. But our power cannot and should not be ignored by those who seek to show us irrelevant, both within and outside our borders, trade 
is one of our strongest tools. Not because we can leverage and bully each other through our single market. We are not and should never be unilateralist by choice, but because the, of the power of influence of our market. As Mrs. Bradford argued, as long as there is globalization, the EU's influence, the so-called Brussels effect will not diminish. We are not unilateralist, and as such, we have to work towards a strong and key role for the WTO. We have to show that negotiations and dialogue, not tariffs and confrontations, are the only way for our societies to benefit from world trade. We have to unlock trade deals with our allies, like the United States, the UK, Mercosur, while also finding solutions to the challenge that countries like China to the global trading, trading system. Only through such multilateral approach that includes our partners, we can truly use the power of trade. Friends, we know how populists act when it comes to trade, which is exactly why we need to involve citizens and hear their concerns. Contrary to some voices out there, trade must not come at the expense of some and the benefit of others. However, as uh, Julia Winkler said, the benefits of trade are not always going where the cost is. It is on this difference that we have to focus. As I mentioned, the emergence of new technologies has posed a very serious challenge to the way of our governments work. Social media has changed how citizens perceive their governments and how they interact with the political sphere. Our societies and our politics are more polarized than ever. The digital revolution that is currently underway also means that much of our workforce is not ready for the labor market of tomorrow. It also means that our businesses are at risk of getting crowded out of the digital economies of the future. I share with my good friend Alex Stuck, not only being old enough to remember that Europe in the 90s was at the forefront of digital systems, but also to say that we got lazy. And we have to wake up. We have to adapt our way of thinking, our policies, to this reality of digitalization. For example, ethics. That would, be, that would have been my question to the panelists. Once, once again, the European Union has been strategic in its thinking and has aimed to find a third way, a European way of doing things. As my colleague and very good friend Pablo Arias mentioned, we need to regulate our digital single market based on our values and our European way of life. If we do so, not only will we deal with the current challenges, we will have a competitive advantage in the economics of the future. Friends, I would like to conclude by saying that we do not have to shy away from our strengths, from our global role as a regulatory power, from the need for an open strategic autonomy, and for the defense of our European way of life. The pandemic has presented a set of new challenges, but most importantly, an opportunity to show European citizens that we are indispensable and that only coordinated policy decisions at the EU level will allow us to move forward. Our economic strategies are based on our European values and in our citizens' best interest. If implemented well, they will lead us to a competitive advantage and towards a truly geopolitical and coherent economic strategy on the global stage. There is hope and we have the necessary means to achieve our goals. Let's work on it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary General, for your very inspiring words. At this point, I'd like to thank our speakers and moderators, and especially you, our online audience. We are glad that technology allows us to stay connected, especially in these difficult times, and discuss important topics for the society. A big thank you goes once again to AT&T, Google, Microsoft, and Sky, who have powered this fully digital economic ideas forum. 
Continue following the Martin Center activities to stay informed and most importantly, stay safe and healthy. Until next time.